It is my, you know, and I, I can't think of a better person to have with us today. Because of his um, line of work, of all the people I've come in contact with and know through my life, he is, um, well, he's, he, he, he's the, he is the most courageous person I know. You know, when we talk about a tough day at the office, um, you know, we say, oh, well, this happened, that happened, this happened. You know, when he would go to the, quote, office, end quote, he was dealing with ruthless drug cartel criminals. And I can't think of a better person to, to discuss how to cope with what all of us are going through than our next guest, Bob Mazur. Bob uh, has earned global acclaim as one of the world's leading experts on the financial escapades of the underworld. There is no one, no one with more firsthand knowledge about how international banks and businesses cater to those who owe own the nearly $2 trillion with a T dollars in criminal proceeds which were laundered annually. For years, in the eyes of organized crime leaders, Bob was a highly successful mob-connected money launderer that helped manage their illicit fortunes. His clients, some of the most famous and deadly drug cartel bosses, Pablo Escobar, for example, offered a half-million-dollar price tag for Bob's head when arrests were made around the world and he was revealed as a highly trained U.S. federal undercover agent. Bob is the author of The Infiltrator, a memoir about his undercover life, much of which was spent acting as a conduit between ruthless drug barons and corrupt, legitimate-appearing senior executives that clean billions in bloodstained money through their otherwise respectable international banks and businesses. Bob has transformed his underworld experience and current-day involvement in the money laundering field into a remarkable lesson for today's business sector. After completing a highly decorated 27-year career as a federal agent in three U.S. agencies, Bob is now the president of KYC Solutions, a firm that provides speaking expert witness and consulting service consulting services to companies worldwide. Bob's book, The Infiltrator, fantastic book, is now, you should get it while people are in quarantine, get the book. It's fantastic. And also get the movie, which is also called The Infiltrator. It, the, the book is now available in 10 languages in more than 50 countries and is the basis for that internationally released major motion picture by the same name, The Infiltrator, starring Brian Cranston, Diane Kruger, and other internationally known cast members. For more information, you can go to Robert Mazur, M-A-Z-U-R, robertmazur.com. It's my honor to uh, welcome back to Operation Freedom, my buddy, Bob Mazur. Bob, welcome back to Operation Freedom. Well, thanks, Dave. It's always a pleasure to be on your show. And, and Bob, uh, since you were last on the show, uh, our thoughts and prayers are with you and your family. Your uh, wonderful mom uh, recently passed away, who was really... um, your rock, your rock throughout your life, and, and your rock when you're involved in the undercover world. Yeah, you know, my mom, probably the most important thing that she taught me um, were the three things that were most important in her life, uh, family, faith, and friends. And in the end, that's really all we have. Um, you know, how much money is in your bank account and um, how your house looks really is not all that important. Um, I got the privilege, um, with the help of hospice, to um, spend more time with my mom, really, in the last four years than I've uh, spent with her collectively in, um, in, in the years before that. And you know, my day was generally an, an hour or two every day, um, at, at sharing time with her that I... Um, I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity uh, to share with her. Um, got to hold her as she passed away, and um, she has had an impact not just on me, but on um, her, my brother, um, and, and our families, and, and uh, 11 great-grandkids nice. that, that she had. So the world's a better place, thanks to Mom, and uh, I have no regrets, and I don't think she does either. So, yeah, and you know what? It's so important for undercover agents to be grounded. People always say to me, well, gee, how could you have done that when you had a wife and two children, and, you know, shouldn't we really have a single guy who's <laughs> out there doing those things? And I can tell you um, yeah. the appetite for risk of a 20-some-year-old single guy uh, versus, as I was, a 30 seven-year-old um, with a wife, children, and a strong mom and dad who 
helped me to understand what was important in life, um, I think helped me tremendously uh, to be able to resist some of the temptations that I, I'm sorry to say, some of my former uh, co-federal uh, uh, undercover agents uh, experienced through, uh, through their assignments. So uh, uh, I'm forever grateful uh, for Mom to have uh, built the foundation. Well, and, and Bob, you, you mentioned that um, some folks in your line of work, and actually I found that in my line of work too as a, as a surgeon, some folks don't have, a, don't have the benefit of an incredible foundation of a, of a loving family um, as you have had and as I have had, loving parents as you've had and I've had. And in fact, um, you had a partner, I, I think we can talk about it, you had a partner that... Um, almost ended up costing you your life because that foundation that he had, he wasn't very grounded, really. Yeah, that's true. Um, closest I came to getting killed on the job. Um, little did I know, uh, the three years before he was assigned to work with me on a very sensitive operation, he uh, was already you know, well down the slippery slope, compromised by two very crafty um, informants from Columbia uh, that he was dealing with. And was on the take. And so when uh, four months after we were working into the undercover operation, unbeknownst to me, I went behind my back to uh, two money, money brokers for the Cali cartel that uh, had come to uh, visit me um, in Florida from Bogota. And um, he went out with them alone and um, told them he was a cop, told them that he worked with uh, Colombian families who uh, were very much able to sell all the coke that they could get and that I was a DEA undercover agent. So I had this uh, ticking time bomb that I had no idea existed, and it took us quite some time to really get it figured out. And then by the time we did, um, we recognized that, hey, this is the officer of the year for a medium-sized city in the United States, unless we have rock-solid proof. Um, this isn't going to produce a, a conviction and, and get him off the streets. So we decided that keeping the undercover operation going for another three months was the best way to do it and feed him uh, misinformation, which we did, and luckily it all worked out in the end. And um, and he became a uh, a guest of the federal prison system for uh, <laughs> uh, an eleven year sentence. So um, anyway, yep, that did happen. So Bob, I, you know, uh, um, you your day at the office is drastically different than pretty much everybody else listening to this radio show, and. There's a lot of um, fear and panic being pushed um, at the public. You know, my, my dad, who was one of the huge pillars of my foundation, used to say, uh, panic is easy. A rational, measured approach is difficult. And he kept drumming that in my head throughout my life until he passed away. So, Bob, when you become an undercover agent, you go through a lot of training, and you get a lot of counseling, and you have um, a lot of, you're taught a lot about persuasion and negotiation and also coping. As people are being handed this chaos on a 24-7 platter, um, how, how do you suggest they cope with, um, in some cases, um, this bad information that is some of the worst information people have ever had about the virus, about the ramifications of the virus, about the financial system. Well, you know, I can, I can tell you how I was taught to try to cope with, um, with tension um, and stress and how that might be applicable to, you know, today's coronavirus issue. I think that, that, that there are ways um, in which it, it might help one to, to get through any difficult time. My difficult time was trying to figure out how to cope with concerns that I could get whacked the next day. Um, and so I, go to a, I put together a, uh, a, a corporate uh, executive learning course that um, includes about nine different categories of um, the steps to connecting with people you want to connect. And one of those categories has to do with training yourself to naturally be a better you. And I think that those, some of the categories under that particular heading 
probably may help to deal with stress in whatever form it may come to you. The first thing that 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 I was told was, you know, to refuse to ref, refuse stress. Um, you know, it's your enemy. You have to recognize to treat health as a core value. Physical conditioning also improves mental capacity, mood, and reduces stress. Mind and body are are uh, equally important and tightly integrated. So, um, in addition to eating well and sleeping, I mean, I I became a runner. I was a I was a runner before that, but I became um, an obsessed runner, <laughs> and uh, I was running marathons. And without getting into, um, without being able to deal with very short hours of uh, of time, because you know I'm dealing with bad guys whose normal day starts probably at around eleven, <laughs> and it ends maybe at about three in the morning. Right. Um, well, when I'm done with them at three in the morning, I've got to start writing reports. Right. Um, in the confines of the security of my undercover house. Um, and I've got to be up in the morning to brief my bosses uh, from some payphone somewhere or however else I was going to do it in a, in a secure way. And so you're getting far, far less sleep. You're under great stress. So if you don't recognize the importance of health um, and how that is so closely integrated with a, a healthy mind, um, that's, that's a major problem. Um, I had to work harder and longer than anyone else to set the standard because I'm supposed to be a leader. If I'm the leader of the undercover operation, which was in eight cities in the United States um, and in, in included a lot of different people, I, I had to be willing to get my hands dirty, uh, work harder and longer than anybody else. I guess my best example of that is that, you know, when, when we uh, – the government funding for this undercover operation was – terrible yeah um we, we if it wasn't for the informants that provided a lot of uh, additional assets we would probably have not been very believable but one of the things that uh, the government did provide was a small amount of money to rent a house that was uh, i mean an apartment that was supposed to be a uh, safe house meeting place and um and i was supposed to say well you know i'm not going to take you to my house i don't expect you to take me to yours that that's crazy i i want people to treat me as an equal and so i through an informant i got a virtually a mansion that um, that we were able to use in the operation but before that when we were using the apartment i mean the walls needed to be painted the furniture needed to be rented the the uh, the uh, recording systems needed to be put in um, I didn't ask other people to do that. I did it. You know, mm-hmm. I, I went and bought the paint. I, I painted the walls. I worked with the technicians to put in the, the uh, recording equipment, and um, and I, I, I made the arrangements to get the furniture that was in there. I didn't expect other people to do those types of things for me. And I think when you when you demonstrate that to people, um, it creates a team uh, and 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 an opportunity to be able to to do things as a team together because you're earning respect every time you're dealing with people in that regard. Being quietly confident um, rather than boastful, um, I think was another important thing that kept getting pounded into my head. Um, volunteering to be a beginner. You know, that's the only way you can grow. Mm. So when it came to the issue of recording equipment, I went to the factory where they built the recorders. I sat down with the engineers. We designed the Cadillac of uh, briefcase recorders together. Um, I wasn't afraid to learn something new about that, and unless you continue to challenge yourself to learn something new, um, you're, you're not going to expand. Um, the other thing I think, uh, and it comes from, I, I love this, this quote from uh, Winston, Sir Winston Churchill, those that fail from, uh, that fail uh, from history are doomed to repeat it. Those that fail to know history and to study history are doomed to repeat it. And money laundering was my most important thing. So there wasn't anything about money laundering that I didn't need to know. I needed to know how it evolved over the last 30 or 40 years. I needed to know everything about how bad guys had made mistakes before so I could explain how I wasn't going to make those mistakes. Um, Another thing that was really pounded into my head was realizing people close to me, solid uh, friends, are a resource to identify my flaws and my weaknesses. That's where I'm going to learn best. The people who I trust, the people who really know me, are the people who can help me to identify my weaknesses. And if I am not willing to embrace knowing my weaknesses, then I, I, I'm, I'm going to be failing. There's no doubt about it. 
um, surrounding myself with people smarter than me. Um, you know, when I left government service, I started an investigative agency that serviced law firms and corporations around the globe. Um, I hired 10 former federal agents from five different agencies, and I can without hesitancy say every single one of them were a heck of a lot smarter than me. And if you're not going to be confident enough in yourself to surround yourself mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. people who are smarter than you, mm -hmm. um, you're, you're not going to be building the kind of team that's going to really be able to make a difference. And being committed to something bigger than yourself, it can't always be about me. It can't be about what I want. When we did Operation Sea Chase, mm -hmm. we, our team, 250 or so total globally, every team member wanted to make a difference in, a, in, in people's lives. Right. Every, people, every person wanted to make the world a better place. And that's what we were fighting for. We weren't fighting for um, recognition. Right. Uh, we the were next, fighting for not the, not the next award. <laughs> no, not the next award. Um, you know, and, and it's important for you to recognize that you need to track your objectives and capture milestones during the course of it so that you can actually determine in your, in your own mind you're, you are, in fact, getting to the things that you set your macro plan, your business plan for, and <clears throat> embracing leadership. Be a mentor. Um, lead by example. Take the time to make sure everyone is comfortable. Let everybody know that fairness is important. Help others to understand their impact on the team. And above all, above all, honesty in all respects is mandatory. And, you know, I, in an undercover capacity, I learned the hard way how faltering from that that position of honesty in all respects is mandatory. I learned a, a very important lesson. Uh, I was a money launderer for the Medellin cartel, and one of the checks that I had issued in the amount of $750,000 had not been negotiated. And I recognized that when I was going through auditing um, the many different accounts that we had. And I allowed myself to do something that I was told by my trainers never to do undercover, and I thought like, like a cop. My colleagues said, you know, hey, maybe that check was in somebody's hand when they were killed, and nobody knows that it never got negotiated, so let's not tell the big guys down there uh, <laughs> that this check hasn't been negotiated. Mm -hmm. I paused and I said, you know, I don't know, man. Um, you know, this will be a great sign of honesty if we volunteer yeah. that we're sitting on 750 grand of their money. Um, but I, I succumbed to the peer pressure. Mm. Lo and behold, it wasn't that much longer. About six months after the check got issued, word came. Gerardo Moncada, right-hand man for oh. Pablo Escobar, oh. was outraged. How in the world could I not have recognized that there was $750,000 extra in my accounts and that that check hadn't been, uh, hadn't been negotiated? And the only, the only kind of people who are in this business that would do something like that are cops. And, and so I paid a big credibility price. So, How did you get out of that one, Bob? Uh, and, you know, and that was, came at the same time that I got uh, uh, surveillances that were detected, surveillances did, that were being done New by other offices in an effort to uh, identify bad guys dropping off money. That was in New York. Yeah, that was in New York, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they got, uh, as we called it in the business, they got burned. <laughs> and, uh, oh, in more than so one way. There were yeah. counter-surveillance out there by the traffickers, and they identified everybody. So in the midst of the 750000 oh. plus, uh, the surveillance problem, I had to talk my way out of it. And uh, I was fortunate that I had somewhat become, in the eyes of one of Moncada's trusted people, a, uh, a friend. And so I met with him. Moncada, Moncada knew that. I met with him under terms that most cops wouldn't do. Um, I was alone, no cover team, in a not so very nice section of Miami, uh, about 1 o'clock in the morning. And, um, and we had a conversation. And, um, and I, I did now remember <laughs> that uh, the likes of Joe Pistone and others that trained me said, you know, don't think like a cop. you got to think like a bad guy when, when that kind of a problem comes up. And so when he said that he was concerned about whether or not we were 
the cops because there was surveillance that was out there or we had a problem in our organization. I told them, listen, there's only one answer to this. We have to stop business immediately. And you know, we're not going to do anything else until both of us orchestrate a situation where we're watching from every possible angle. We'll figure out who the, who the person is who's been disloyal. And if they're on my side, which I can't imagine, but if they are, if they're on my side, I promise you I'll eliminate the problem. And, um, and he assured me he would do the same on his side. So um, as time went on, thank God, <laughs> uh, that became less and less of a focus. Um, because obviously there wasn't anybody that we were going to eliminate, and um, and and uh, we were able to, I think, just basically being willing to shut down business entirely when you were otherwise receiving a million to two million dollars a day is not is not something that normally would be done by you know the law enforcement community. So um, that concern uh, lost its wind, and um, and we were able to continue on.